talk to you tonight on the subject of building a barrier breaking ministry. In Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, it reads this way, and it happened while Paulus was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to, him, to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now notice what they said. They said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And so then he asked them, he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And then, and then they said, we were baptized into John's baptism. And how many know that was water baptism? But then in verse 4, Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, and that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, watch this. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. Now, the men were about 12 in all. And when he went into the synagogue, he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened... And did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before they drew the, before uh, the multitude. He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years. Someone say two years. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jew and Greek. Tonight, I want to take a few moments to speak to you on the subject of building a barrier-breaking ministry. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Building a barrier-breaking ministry. How many get excited about this kind of stuff? I, I know I do. I know when I come to a, a session like this, I really want to hear something that's going to help me in my city. And that's my prayer that this entire weekend we'll receive things that will help us. In Acts chapter 19, we find that Paul makes his way to Ephesus. And I know we have preachers here. Everybody here is a preacher. <laughs> we know that Ephesus was very strategic. I mean, it was so strategic that even in the book of Revelations chapter 3, the church of Ephesus was mentioned. How many remember that? And what we find here is that it was a strategic city because after Paul's arrival, the church and the city experienced a powerful revival. History gives credit to the fact that because of the events that took place in Ephesus, that the gospel actually spread. Because of the events in Ephesus, because of the revival in that city, that revival actually spread literally through all of Asia. Now, when you take a look at this, this study, you take a look at the church of Ephesus in Asia Minor, there were literally four significant things that ushered in revival. And when I talk about building a breakthrough ministry, how many know we've got to talk about ministry that will usher in revival? How many of you, when you think of your city, you couldn't help but want to see a revival begin to take place in your city? And I really believe with all my heart it's important that as pastors and as leaders, we begin to study revival. We begin to ask ourselves, Lord, what does it take to begin to see revival in our city? There were four significant things that ushered in this revival. If you're taking notes, and I encourage you to do that tonight. Number one, write this down. The disciples received the power of the Holy Spirit. It was right here that the disciples, for the first time, received the power of God. Because up to that point, there were disciples in the region. Now listen to this. There were disciples in the region... But those disciples could be considered powerless disciples. And I'll tell you why they were powerless. That even though they had the title of disciple, they weren't experiencing change around them. You see, these disciples were unable to bring change. It wasn't that these disciples weren't good people. How many know we have people in our church and we look at them and we even call them disciples? How many know you look at this and you know, those are good people. 
Those are good people. It's not that these disciples weren't good people. It's not that these disciples weren't educated. It's not that these disciples weren't great thinkers. It's not that these disciples didn't have good character and good minds. But we find is that these disciples did not possess the power of the Holy Spirit in their ministry. When Paul came into the territory, he says, he says, into what baptism were you baptized? What, what baptism did you have? And they said, we had the baptism of John. We had the baptism of water, the baptism of repentance. But what you find about these leaders is that they were dipped in water, but they were not yet dipped in oil. And what do we need in our region? What do we need in our churches? What do we need in Victory Outreach? We don't just need leaders that have been dipped in water. We need leaders that have been dipped in the oil and the power of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be powerless? It's to have a demand placed on you that you are unable to produce for. To be powerless is to have a demand placed on you that you were unable to be, be unable to produce for. Just about a week or so ago, I was hanging out with my three daughters. They're all teenagers. One's a young adult. And we went to we went out, spent the day together in L.A. And and uh, the whole day they were complaining how their phone was dying. And it's funny with this generation, it seems like the phone is attached to the heart. Like whenever the phone is dying, it's almost like the heart itself is dying. It's just, I'm dying. I'm melting like the witch and the Wizard of Oz. And so we were scrambling to find chargers, and I found two chargers. See, to be powerless is to have a demand placed on you that you can't fulfill. Imagine if your phone was dying. And you go and you scramble and you find a charger. And then what do you got to do? You got to take that charger and you got to plug it into the wall. And have you ever taken a charger, plug it into a wall to find that the socket in the wall itself is dead? Come on, talk to me, somebody. Well, that's the type of disciples who were in Ephesus. Before Paul got there, they didn't have the power. They couldn't meet the demand. They couldn't bring change. But when Paul came in, the Bible says he took his hands. He laid hands on them. And the Bible says they were filled with the spirit of the living God. They began to speak in tongues. They began to prophesy. And now they had the power to bring revival. They had the power to bring change. Are there any leaders here tonight that you desire the power of the Holy Spirit? spirit so the first thing is they receive power man I yelled on that one didn't I the second thing we see is that false prophets were exposed what brought in this revival is that the false prophets in the land were exposed Paul recognized this is that we cannot change what we are unwilling to confront and what we find about Paul's leadership is he was not afraid to confront and expose though, those who were leading the people to spiritual destruction. I know some of you say, what is he talking about? I know some of you are understanding me. Is anyone understanding what I'm saying? Think about your church. Think about your ministry. Paul was not afraid to confront those who were leading the people to spiritual destruction. You see, we must be willing to confront and we recognize that in, that when you begin to confront, there's going to be opposition in your leadership. In fact, revival flowed because Paul and the disciples were willing to endure opposition. I feel this is so important to say to leaders tonight is that we will have revival when we can endure opposition. We will have revival when leaders can endure fierce attack. When you look at Paul and the disciples, they were able to endure fierce opposition in the region. They overcame the attacks. They overcame the conspiracies. They overcame the opposition. Now, what's the key? It's not just that they overcame, but they overcame the attacks and the opposition. Watch this without losing a heart for the mission. Am I preaching all right tonight? How many leaders have we lost because in the midst of their battle and in the midst of their storm and the midst of the spiritual warfare, they didn't come out stronger than they were. They came out defeated. They came out discouraged. They left the church. They quit the ministry. But we are Victory Outreach and we're not called to quit. 
Come on and help me preach this word tonight. We are Victory Outreach and we are not called to quit. Yes, we've been attacked. Yes, we've been under attack. Yes, the enemy comes against us. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. He's given us the power to overcome and to stay true to the vision. Ooh, tell your neighbors, stick it out. That's what we need. We need leaders who are going to stick it out. They overcame the conspiracies. They overcame the plots without being discouraged to stay true to doing what God had called them to do. You know what I believe is this? I believe that the fire inside of their leadership was stronger than the fire that opposed them. And when you're a leader who's been filled with the Holy Ghost, are there any leaders who have been filled with the Holy Ghost? Okay, God bless 10 of you. Are there any leaders that could say, I've been filled, that, that there's a fire. Come on, son. That, 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 that there's a fire inside of me. There's a fire inside of me that's stronger than the fire that opposes me. There's a vision. There's a passion. There's an oil. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody here tonight that is experiencing revival? Woo. See, they expose what needed to change. What's the third thing we find here is that the people were cut to the heart. Where the word of God is preached, where the vision of victory outreach is preached, the real vision, I want you to know that people will be cut to the heart. When you study the book of Acts, when Peter gave the first sermon to the, to the 3,000, to the thousands that were there and the 3,000 got saved, the Bible says that he used the word and the people were cut to the heart. What brings change in a person's life? It's not your opinion. It's the word of the living God that brings change. It's not your philosophy. It's not what you think in your head. It's the living word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword tonight. And the Bible says that revival came because the people were cut to the heart. The fear of God impacted the people for positive change. If you read a little bit down in the scripture, you will find that the people were um, the people uh, were, were willing to uh, make changes. In fact, when you study the scripture, they burn their superstitious scrolls and their charms. They cast magic out of the region. They cast out Santaria. Come on, somebody. They cast out black power. Come on, somebody. They cast out Rasa. Thinking, can I hear an amen? They cast out their Raiders jerseys and their Cowboys jerseys. And you don't want to say nothing to me, but are there any leaders that want to experience revival? You want to see the power of God? Woo! That's strong stuff coming from a Raider fan. They were successful in casting out the cultic and cultural iconography. They threw out the Aztec calendars. Come on, somebody. They even threw out the Pane the Ria calendar that you get when you go by Pan Dulce. Can I hear an amen? How many of you want revival? How many of you want revival? How many want an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? See, they, they confronted these things. They cast the witchcraft that permeated the people and kept the people bound. The yokes of bondage were broken. And watch this. Paul was successful at moving their identity from Greek culture to kingdom culture. From Chicano culture to kingdom culture. From the culture of your city to the culture of Victory Outreach International. Come on and give God a praise right now. We are an early church revival. And that's when revival begins to flow. Now, what's the final thing here? Did you get something so far tonight? Pretty good stuff in the word, right? But the fourth thing we find is that Paul preached, taught, and trained disciples in the school of Tyrannus. The Bible says that he did it for two straight years. So while he was confronting false prophets and while he was filling people with the Holy Ghost, come on, somebody. 
And while he was exposing false culture and removing all that, he still had time. Because how many know Paul was a spiritual warrior? But how many know Paul is also a strategic leader? Paul still had time to train disciples in the school of Tyrannus for two years. If you study it, you will find that Paul taught those students for five hours a day, every day, for two years. Now, why do I bring this out? is because when I look at Paul, I look at a leader who recognized the need. We know that Paul came in, right? And he looked in that territory and he encountered some powerless disciples. And I kind of see Paul like a Pastor Sonny. Goes in and right away, he's able to recognize the need for breakthrough in that area. Are you with me so far? So Paul, he begins to rent a space from a man by the name of Tyrannus, and he uses that building for training. See, what I find in Paul and what we need in Victory Outreach are leaders who are going to take growth and breakthrough personal. Breakthrough is not only going to come through the pastors. Breakthrough doesn't just come through the pastor's wife. Breakthrough doesn't only come through the leaders with the titles. Can I hear an amen? But breakthrough is when leaders take the spirit of growth and breakthrough personal. Do you know what breakthrough begins with? It always begins with a leader with a breakthrough mindset. When Paul encountered these disciples of John, he asked them the critical question, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, we haven't even yet heard there was a Holy Spirit. We hadn't even heard that there was a helper. We hadn't even heard that there was a deliverer. We hadn't even heard that you could get free. We hadn't yet heard that that, that you don't have to be hooked on heroin your entire life. We hadn't heard that you had to, you know, be smoked out on methamphetamine. We hadn't heard that you could have a good marriage. We hadn't heard that you could serve God for longer than six months. We didn't hear that you, you, you didn't have to be a church hopper. You ain't saying nothing to me. Help me preach tonight. We never heard that we didn't have to walk this thing by ourselves. We didn't know that there was a power that we did not have. We didn't know that there was a power greater than money, a power greater than drugs, a power greater than sex, a power than greater than position and status. We did not know that there was a Holy Spirit given to us from heaven. You see, Paul recognized the need. They didn't know the benefits of being dipped in the oil of God. And I want to tell you this. Before revival can break out in a region, it must first break out in a leader. Let me me tell you what we're called to do, Victor Outreach. We're called to kick legion out the region. Come on, who caught it? We're called to cast the devil out of our city. We're called to kick bondage out of our neighborhood. We're called to take the, uh, the drug addiction and gang mentality and the, and the people coming out of prison and those generational curses. And we're called to cast it out of our city, cast it out of our region. Legion has to go. But it happens in us first. Put your hand in your heart and say, me first. See, when it happened in Paul, he got personally involved in discipleship. And when he opened up this school, the school of Tyrannus, it wasn't for the purpose of just reasoning. It wasn't head-to-head stuff. If you study it, Paul was doing head-to-head stuff in the synagogue. See, the Jews were open to Jesus. They, they said, yeah, we're open to Jesus, man. And Paul went and he taught, you know, he always taught in the synagogue. And it was there that he would reason with the Pharisees and the Sadducees about the word of God. And they were open to a certain degree. Watch. To a certain degree. What closed them up and what caused them to be hard is when Paul started teaching them 
about the power of God. And I wonder how many of our churches, even in Victory Outreach, even believe in miracles. I wonder how many of our pastors really believe that God can totally deliver a drug addict. I wonder how many of our leaders believe that God could totally restore marriage. I wonder if there's anyone here that really believes that with some of the challenge that we're facing as church leaders, that the power of God is real enough and strong enough to bring permanent change in a person's life. I want to tell you, my friend, it's not going to happen with head knowledge. It's got to happen in your heart. And what Paul did is he took these disciples and he put them in the school. And he didn't reason with them. He didn't give them information. He gave them something called impartation. He didn't just give them scriptures to read and, and didn't just take them to three points in a poem. Can I hear an amen? There was a demonstration. I think about that school. I can imagine people coming in bound, getting delivered. I think about that school, I can think of some people having demons and those demons being cast out. I can imagine that school, that it was a school of the supernatural, a school of, is there anybody here that gets excited about this kind of thing? A school of miracles. A school of miracles. For five hours a day, for two years, he taught him about the kingdom of God. He taught him a vision that would impact the region. He gave them the kingdom mentality. And God began to also do something in Paul. Because if you study the story, you will find that when Paul wrote his letter to the church in Corinth, he wrote it from the school of Tyrannus. And it's there that he wrote the famous scripture. He says, and my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive, persuasive words of man's wisdom. It was from that school that he said, I wasn't trying to impress nobody with my words. He says, they didn't come with the persuasive words of man's wisdom, but they came in the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but that your faith would be in the power of the living God. Is there anyone that believes that revival can break loose in our city? That revival can break loose in our city. Paul had a revelation. He said, why am I speaking this today? I know some of you looking at me like, where, where in the world is he going with this? You're like, I came to hear the vision. I came to hear direction. Let me tell you, you're getting direction right now. Because it's causing for some of us to take a real honest evaluation of whether we have a spiritual breakthrough in our church or not. Oh, come on, somebody. It's causing for us to really take a real evaluation. Are miracles still happening? See, we're not an ordinary ministry. We are the ministry of Victory Outreach. I'll say it again. We are not an ordinary ministry. We are the ministry of Victory Outreach. And our ministry has been birthed in miracle working power. We are not a regular church. We are a breakthrough church. And we are not a church that promises change. We can also present the power of the Holy Spirit that will bring that change. We say to our cities, put the demand on us because we are not powerless. We are filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Woo. We're Victory Outreach. And that's why as leaders, we must keep with a barrier breaking mentality. Ask your neighbor, are you a barrier breaker? Think about it. Because sometimes we think that to be a barrier breaking church, we have to be a mega church. But I came to tell you that not every church will be a mega church. Building a mega church is hard. It requires a lot of death, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of blood. A lot of skill, a lot of focus, a lot of time. You might have to put some things in your life on the altar to get that mega church to come out. But not everybody's called to be a mega church. But I do believe that everybody is called 
to be a barrier breaking church. I don't care what ministry you lead. You could lead the gang. You could lead the home. You could have one cell group in your church that you oversee. And I want you to know God wants to use you to bring barrier breaking ministry in that area that you oversee. Not every church is going to be a mega church. We're going to have some mega churches because it's been prophesied by the man of God. But every church can be healthy. Every church can be barrier breaking. We don't have to have dry services. We don't have to have dry, collegiate, cerebral preaching. We're not called to be boring. We're called to be filled with the Spirit of God, and we are called to prophesy. We're called to speak to dry bones. We may not all be big, but we can all get better. And I believe that wherever we plant our flag, we're called to bring a breakthrough. Whatever city you've planted your flag in, there should be the evidence and the markings of revival in your city. Mm. There should be the power of God flowing in your services. This is not on my notes, but I feel the Holy Ghost right now. See, Paul was the type of leader who was a barrier-breaking leader and a barrier-breaking man of God. When we see Paul, it reminds me of our personal Paul, Pastor Sonny. How am I excited to hear him speak tomorrow night? I mean, tomorrow morning. Pastor Sonny is the definition of a breakthrough leader. We, 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 we see him in him a leader who knows how to bring the breakthrough wherever he goes. Wherever he plants his flag, wherever he uses his gift, wherever he pours his resources, he goes in with the mentality for breakthrough. For breakthrough. Are you experiencing breakthrough? Are you seeing breakthrough in your ministry? You see, sometimes, and I've seen Pastor Sonny in South Africa bring the breakthrough. Panama, bring the breakthrough. Even here, six years here in San Diego. One of the greatest times of my life for all of us was to just sit under his leadership and watch how he brought the breakthrough here in San Diego. But you have to ask yourself this question, what makes for a breakthrough ministry? I mean, we hear it, we know it, we see it, but what makes for it? Well, I'm going to tell you this very clearly, and this is what we need more than ever, is we need leaders who are going to work with a strategy. I'm talking about a strategy. I'm not talking about just having church on Sunday. That's not a strategy. We, we need leaders who are going to have a breakthrough strategy. I know sometimes we can go to the conferences and hear about the vision and hear about the pattern of ministry. Because many of us have churches and you say, I I'm following the pattern of ministry. I'm following the pattern of ministry. Well, if you're following the pattern of ministry, then why aren't you breaking through? I'll tell you why you're not breaking through. Because the pattern of ministry is not enough. Within the pattern of the vision, you must have the spirit of the pattern. When Pastor Sonny came here to San Diego, I, 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 I never forget it. One day he was preaching. People were looking at him sideways, like, what's this guy talking about? And he's looking at him, and he's saying, you know, I know if I, I want to tell you guys something. He goes, if I wasn't the founder, you would think I don't have the vision. See, they had a pattern, but they didn't have the spirit of the pattern. Let me put it this way. They didn't have the spirit of the founder. And you know what's going to bring breakthrough? It's not just the pattern. I have a home. <laughs> Whoop-de-doo. I have a service on Sunday. I have the VO logo on my building. 
I wear the gang shirt. I wear the women's shirt. I gave $200 to United We Can. Where's the breakthrough? Is this too strong? Where's the breakthrough? Where's the revival? Because the pattern's not enough. You've got to have the spirit of the pattern. You've got to have the spirit of God. You have to have the spirit of miracles. As a leader, watch this. you got to be dipped in oil. You see, what's going to bring revival? It's when we begin to recognize what it takes to build a breakthrough ministry. Let me give you four things, and I believe the Holy Spirit's going to fall in this place. Did you get some so far? Yeah. Number one, write this down. We must recognize and admit that there are barriers in our midst. That's what Paul did. He went in, and he saw that the Holy Spirit was not in the disciples. And how many know that's the greatest barrier? He recognized there were barriers. And I think this, I think if we're going to be able to have revival and take our ministry into breakthrough, you got to be honest. Stop lying to yourself. Stop rationalizing. Don't say, oh, if I had Pastor Al's music, I would have the breakthrough. No. Remember, blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice. Focus, hard work. Admit there are barriers. What are some of the barriers that we must admit? Number one, there are mental, mental and emotional barriers. Mental barriers happen when we cannot see beyond our weaknesses. How do we know we have a mental barrier? Is when you don't look at the opportunities, you only look at the challenges. And if we want to have breakthrough. And we want to begin to see supernatural breakthrough. We must move beyond our weaknesses because oft, often our outlook limits us. Leader, I came to tell you, it's not what you see when your eyes are open. It's what you see when your eyes are shut. Are you still dreaming? Are you still believing? Are you still visualizing what God can do? You see, we need to be able to grow to our full potential. And we can't look at just our weaknesses as obstacles. I believe we must look at our weaknesses as opportunities. Because the Bible teaches us that he's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And what I want to tell you today is that if you'll look beyond your weaknesses, there is a promise fulfilled on the other side of your breakthrough. Why do I say this to us tonight? Because often we allow our weaknesses and our walls to discourage us. How many leaders have we lost to a spirit of discouragement? How many pastors are in the pulpit, but they're not preaching with power because of a spirit of discouragement? How many leaders are afraid to challenge people because of a spirit of, ex see, see how hard it is to confront stuff? Just understand the warfare going on right now. You're looking at me like, I do not like this guy, but we're going to kick Legion out of the region. That's all right. It's all right. This is warfare preaching. Can I hear an amen? How many want to break through those weaknesses and grow in your mentality? See, when you're talking about mentality, you're also talking about emotional intelligence. Sometimes we focus on building our intellect, but we don't build our emotion. And I want to tell you that God is looking to move through a leader who's emotionally mature. God is looking to move through a leader, watch this, that can handle the confrontation. He's looking to move through a leader that can handle the correction. He's looking to move to a leader who can handle the attacks of the enemy. And what God wants to do is he wants to grow some leaders that don't just have head knowledge, but they've enlarged their heart, they've enlarged their character, they've enlarged their pain thresholds. Woo, this is good stuff. The second breakthrough that we must admit is the generational barriers. 
Generational barriers must be broken when, when we begin to recognize that the church starts showing signs of age. Let me tell, let me, get, let me give you guys some bad news today. <laughs> and that news applies to me also. We're getting older. Even the gang. Yeah, yeah. And not some of these new ones, but some of y'all used to be in the gang. Used to have hair. <laughs> used to be skinny and good looking like the ones you see now. I got some bad news. We're getting older. Can I hear an amen? And see, we've got to recognize the generational barriers when the church starts to age. When, when the church starts to age, that's when we need, watch this, generational breakthrough. In Victor Outreach, we want to build churches that are multi-ethnic, multi multi-economic, and multi-generational. We, we recognize that our vision fits everybody. And everybody can fit our vision. And, and, and I believe that there are young people in the church. But do we have a youth movement in the church? Some of you older leaders, are you empowering your young people or are you holding your young people down? Some of you gang leaders, are you giving your young people an opportunity or are you holding your young people down? Are you saying to them what they said about you, you can only do so much? Come on, somebody. We got to expose it. And if we want to have breakthrough, we've got to start believing in the young people again. Come on, clap with me. We gotta, we've got to ask ourselves, is our church ready to receive and equip hungry young lions who want to answer the call of God into the ministry? Pastors, is our church ready to receive them? Is our church ready to give them a place where they can grow? Is our church ready not only to give them a place where they can grow, but are you ready to expose yourself to them? I had this revelation in my church. And even in Victor and San Diego, a lot of people view our church as young, which it is. But it was difficulty in my life that made me see it. It was hardship and struggle in my life that when I begin to look at the future of my church and the future of our ministry here in San Diego, I begin to say to myself, if I don't get personally involved, I'm going to lose the next generation. I came out of the hospital after being there for five months and I'm in Boston for another five months, almost two years being out of it, being totally out of it, walked into my church and saw all kinds of new people. And I, and I was grateful that the church was full, but I wasn't satisfied because I had left the discipleship to the leaders. I had allowed the leaders to open up their discipleship homes and work with the people. I had allowed the leaders to uh, have Bible group and, and win all kinds of people. And when I looked into the church, I saw a full church, but I didn't see an army. Mm. Just like some of us, you look at a full church and your venue might be full, but you don't have an army. And I said, how am I going to see this young generation not just be a bunch of pew warmers and casual churchgoers and just posting on Facebook that they came to Victory Outreach today and now they're going to another church next week and another church next week. We are Victory Outreach. I'm called to raise up an army. How am I going to do it? I've got to get personally involved. I've got to be willing to get back into the trenches of discipleship. Come on, say amen. amen. We opened up our own little school of Tyrannus. We call it Family Life Flow. And that's the least intimidating name we could have picked. But the vision was clear is that we wanted to raise up an army of Victor Irish disciples. And I want to tell you, in, in two years, we've graduated over 1,200 students. It's heavy. This Sunday, we'll be graduating our, our very first class. After two years of training, almost two years of training, we're graduating 180 young leaders into full-time ministry. Come on, somebody. 
And many of them are already involved in full-time ministry. We've sent people to South Africa. We've sent people to the UTC. We've sent out churches. We've sent out youth pastors. It's beginning to work because we recognize that generations create a barrier. What's the third barrier? Is financial barriers. The question we must be honest about is have the leaders effectively bought into the vision through their financial giving? I'm so grateful to share this tonight because I think there's a lot of us that might be here that you're here and you're leader entitled, but you haven't fully bought in with your finances. And I want to tell you that the question we must ask is do the leaders demonstrate a personal and powerful spirit of generosity? Do the leaders in our churches demonstrate a personal and powerful spirit of generosity with joy? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. We'll take it if you're grumpy. But God will bless it if you get happy about it. Can I hear an amen? It was Paul that said that. Why is that so important? Because people have a tendency to give what they believe in. You can always tell a leader's priority by looking at his checkbook. If you spend more money on your lowrider than you do on tithes and offering. You need to get out of leadership. If you spend more time, money on hobbies and personal pleasure, and you're not helping us build, how could you call yourself a leader? Because the church rises and falls on leadership. The, the church rises and falls on people who have not just bought in with their talent. You say, I'll give you my talent. Well, listen, let's be honest. Your talent ain't that great. I know you think it's great, but come on, bro. Where's the breakthrough? I'm giving my time. Everybody's giving their time. But who are going to be the leaders that are going to be personally generous? Who are going to be the leaders that are going to make God first in their giving? And not only give the tithe, but go above and beyond. Mm, unpopular preaching tonight. I'm, I'm trying to give you the breakthrough. I'm trying to see revival break out in your city. Some of you need buildings. Don't complain about not having a building if you don't give generously and have personal, powerful generosity. Don't complain now. Just enjoy that hot fan on you. Because that's what you paid for. It's too strong? How many want the breakthrough? Come on, how many want the breakthrough? Come on, how many want the breakthrough? See, when someone gives of their finances, they leave no doubt about where they stand in the vision. When someone gives of their tithes automatically, systematically, when someone gives to a building pledge, when someone gives generously and goes above and beyond, there's no doubt about what they believe. But likewise, when someone doesn't give, and someone holds back. Let me tell you, the ch early church, God had no tolerance for those who held back. There was a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And they tried to show off like they were given a lot of money, and the Holy Spirit struck them dead. Why? Because God says it's too early to bring that spirit. He had to kill that spirit so that revival would keep on burning. You ain't saying nothing to me in this place. How many want revival? What's the final thing? I'm going to end. I had more, but I'm going to end. I feel God's moving already. What's the final thing? The final thing, the final barrier we need to break. Did you get something tonight? Are the spiritual breakthroughs, spiritual barriers. You see, we can only have revival when we could recognize and be honest about the spiritual barriers that are stopping us from experiencing a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. You see, spiritual barriers happen 
when the church becomes a place of stagnant faith. When, when the church becomes a place of stagnant faith. When there's a lifeless walk in leadership. When there is a grudging giving in leadership. When there's a spirit of fatigue in the leader. And I came to tell you tonight that if you came into this place fatigued and you came into this place tired and you came into this place lacking, there's an oil available to you. Come on. We must beware of leaders who become stale, stagnant, and unteachable. Spiritual barriers. And I want to tell you, when I think about our church here, one thing is we've sought to do since Pastor Sonny took over the church 16 years ago is it wasn't so much about the pattern. It was more about the spirit. And what I believe we've been successful at doing is maintaining a spirit of revival in our environment. And let me tell you this, is that the devil has done all he can to take our spirit. The devil has done all he can to attack the spirit of revival in this place. When we were worshiping the Lord and when we were magnifying, how many of you felt the spirit of God just filling you? We've experienced that week in and week out. And one of the things we determined in our heart is that if we're going to stay in the spirit, we've got to fight for our environment. I believe that's what some of you need. You, you need to learn how to fight for your environment. You, you got to get back to the place as a leader where you're experiencing a powerful and personal revival in your leadership. I believe that sometimes we, 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 we say, Lord, send revival, and we want revival to come heaven down. We believe that revival comes heaven down, and it certainly does. Someone said, if you want revival, draw a circle around yourself and say, fire, fall in the circle. You know, the old preacher says, get under the spout where the glory comes out. When the praises go up, come on, the blessings come down. And I tell you that revival certainly is heaven down. But if you want to have breakthrough in your city, you must recognize that revival is not just heaven down, it's spirit out. It's what comes out of your mouth when you talk. It's the spirit of joy. It's the passion that comes off of your life. It's the enthusiasm in the services. I tell my church all the time, listen, you better say amen or I will leave you. Because I'm not going to kill myself trying to, with that, I dare you to bless me face. You better learn to smile in church. You better learn to give God praise in church. You better learn to stand on your feet in church. If you want to be in my church, I, I, we don't have dead church at Victory Outreach San Diego. We believe in revival. We believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. And what am I trying to teach you here tonight is that when you've been dipped in oil, that's when revival could begin to flow out of you. I don't know what you're experiencing in your city, but the one thing I hear in the heart of our pastors, the one thing I hear in the heart of our pastor's wives, the one thing that I hear in the ministry leaders that call me and Facebook me and Instagram me and text me is they tell me, Pastor, pray for my city because we need a breakthrough. Pray for my church because we need a breakthrough. Sickness is trying to hit our church. Problems have tried to hit our church, but we have some leaders here tonight that God is going to dip you in some oil and you're going to take revival back. You're going to take revival back. See, I want to tell you, just stand with me. You're the one God wants to use. Touch your neighbor and tell him you're the one God wants to use. But something 
has to happen in our life. There are five core values we have in this church that I want to share with you. Number one, behavior determines our culture. The words we speak, the quality we possess, the unity of our leadership, the family atmosphere, the love and the forgiveness determines our culture. The second thing is our attitude determines our atmosphere. Someone say attitude. Someone say attitude. John Maxwell said attitude determines your altitude. And we recognize that if we want spirit-filled ministry and we want Holy Ghost breakthrough and if we want passion and we want positivity and we want joy because how many know we're working with some heavy people and we need a positive spirit that if we're going to have that type of breakthrough we've got to have the right attitude. The third thing is that the investment determines a return. We believe in seed time and harvest. We believe in sowing, planting, and we also believe in reaping and multiplication. Do you believe in that tonight? See, God commanded Victor Outreach San Diego to sow in the land. Look at your neighbor and tell him, sow in the land. One young person in our church rose up one time and said, be loyal to your soil. The Lord told Isaac to go to the land of Gerar and to plant his seed there. And he would reap a blessing. The Bible says in one year, he reaped a hundredfold blessing. The Bible said he went from being the weakest to being strong, to being the stronger, to being the strongest in the land. And when you begin to plant your seed and when you begin to sow your seed and you begin to water your seed and you begin to sacrifice willingly, can I hear an amen? That's when God begins to raise you up. Elisha was chosen by Elijah. And the Bible says he was plying with 12 yokes of oxen. And he, he slaughtered the oxen and followed him. Watch. He became his spiritual son. Son. S-O-N. S. Sacrifice. O. Obedience. N. Never looking back. We need some sons at Victory Outreach. We need some sons to begin to rise up. What's the fourth thing? Character determines the trust. Someone say character. We want revival. And if we're going to have revival, we need leaders who can handle it. We need leaders of integrity. We need leaders whose words match their walk. If you talk it, you better be about it. I've been talking loud today, haven't I? But you can be sure I'm, I'm being about it. Can I hear an amen? We need character. Weak leadership weakens the vision. Weak leadership weakens the voice of the church to the community. But trusted leadership, character leadership, makes us strong and makes the vision possible. Someone say character. And let me give you the last one here. Work. Work. The Bible says a lazy man chases fantasies. But he who labors will have an abundance of food. Woo. Look at your chair. Tell me, you, 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 got, you got to work. You got to work. You got to work that land. You got to work that region. You got to work that city. Work determines the result. Little seed little work, little harvest. Big seed, big work, big focus. Come on, somebody. And you keep on working it, and you keep on working it, and you don't give up when the devil comes against you, and you don't back down, and you don't throw in the towel. Come on, work your land, work your land, work your land. Here comes the big harvest. Come on, somebody. Here comes the breakthrough. The wall's going down. The new building is coming. The leaders are raising up. Come on, help me out. I'm done preaching. You got to begin to work it. You got to begin to work it. You got to begin to work it. Lift up your hands all over this place. And you say, I'm that leader.